On today's show... I want to be a physical therapist because I know what happened to me and I want to give back. His spirit has always been there, his drive. There was never a quit in him. Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Lori Hartshorn. And we are so happy that you've joined us today. You know, we have a powerful program today that may clear any doubt about the question, do miracles happen today? That's right. We have two incredible stories where lives were changed in an instant. Mm. And both Heather and Isaiah share how it wasn't for, if it wasn't for a miracle, neither of them would have overcome the odds. So true. And in our Courageous Living segment today, Lori shares a few secrets to becoming an overcomer. If the odds seem stacked against you. But first, February is Black History Month, and in honor of this, we are featuring a trailer from a powerful documentary by one of our favorite past guests, film producer Jared Brock's latest work, Josiah. Mm -hmm. Take a look. Josiah Henson was the little known man behind one of the most notorious characters in history, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom. In talking about Uncle Tom, we have to be careful because it has a legacy rich in racism. The term Uncle Tom has become this derogatory term, but really the character was never written to be that way. Uncle Tom's Cabin was a massive global success. It sold over a million copies in its first year in print and became the best-selling novel of the century. It was used to put a face to slavery. It was the great exposure of man's inhumanity to man. It not only balloons up in sales, but there's also a negative reaction to it. And then the controversy begins where people are criticizing the book, saying, how can this be? Blacks being whipped and beaten and tortured, it just can't be. Harriet Beecher Stowe pushed back by publishing a giant book of all her sources called The Key to Uncle Tom's Cabin. On page 26 and 27, she talks about Josiah Henson. Henson's life story was integral to Uncle Tom's Cabin. After more than a century of racism and tens of millions of copies in print, everyone has heard of Uncle Tom. But how have we never heard of Josiah Henson? How has history forgotten this man? From that time to the present, I have been called Uncle Tom, and I feel proud of the title. If my humble words in any way inspired that gifted lady to write, I have not lived in vain, for I believe her book was the beginning of the glorious end. Powerful. You know, Jared spent years researching and tracing the journey of Josiah Henson, the man who inspired the main character from the book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And now 25-year-old Heather is thrown from a Jeep when it flipped. Watch this incredible story of survival with a miraculous ending. First responders arrive at a single car accident in Octibaha County, Mississippi. A Jeep had run off the road and flipped several times, throwing three occupants from the vehicle. Two were confirmed dead. One, 26-year-old Heather Hughes, showed barely any signs of life. They were not very sure that she was alive. And then as I got to her, I realized that she did have a pulse and uh, we were able to work on her. Paramedic Stuart Bird and crew rushed Heather to a local hospital. Someone there who knew the family called Heather's mom, Ann, with the news. She said, Ann, Heather's been in a car wreck and it don't look good. I immediately started praying and said, God, you can't let her die. Later, she and her husband, Jean, arrived to find medical staff still fighting to save their daughter. When I walked through the emergency room doors and she was on that stretcher, and they were working on her and the bone was sticking out here. She was real bloody. 
They had a tube down her mouth and into her throat, and she was just bad. Heather suffered numerous fractures, a broken neck, and was bleeding internally from her liver and lungs. Needing advanced care, she was put in a medically induced coma and medevac to a level two trauma center in Tupelo, Mississippi. I kissed her on the head, told her I loved her, hang in there. They uh, went ahead and got her to Tupelo and we came on up. On the way to Tupelo with Jean, Ann called friends and a Christian radio station asking for prayer. I called WFCA and he put it out on the radio and then people that I had not gotten up with found out about it. We just prayed that God would work a mighty work in Heather. Heather made it to North Mississippi Medical Center alive, where Dr. Robert McCulley and his team were waiting. There was only a 20% chance she would live. And she had blood uh, in her abdominal cavity. She was bleeding from a liver laceration. The blood we gave her would just bleed right back out. I didn't think she was going to survive. When Ann and Jean arrived an hour later, they went in to see Heather. She was stabilized, but doctors had offered little hope. He said, I don't think she's going to make it, Jean. And he looked at me, and he said, Ann, where is your faith? Ann found a quiet place in the hospital to be alone and pray. I said, God, you gave her to me. And if you want her back, then you have her. But I sure wish you would leave her with me for a while longer. But again, if you think this is what you want, then give me the strength to go through it. And I felt such a peace come over me that I didn't question it anymore. It's just somehow I knew she was going to be all right. But holding on to that faith would be tested when Heather's vitals crashed again. I got a call that her pressure was 58 over 30, and her oxygen saturations were back low again, so we're going to lose her. It's probably approaching 100%. Ann continued to believe God for a miracle. I would just look at them and say, she's going to be fine. And I know they really thought I was either in shock or crazy. But I know what God had given me when I prayed, so I wasn't in doubt at all. After several hours, Dr. McCulley got her stabilized, but he was still unable to offer encouragement. Even if we get her through the next 72 hours and she stabilizes, then we still have to worry about ARDS, shock lung, and sepsis and infections developing. More family members began to arrive as word continued spreading for people to pray. Heather remained stabilized, and two weeks later was well enough to be brought out of her coma. I had to just shout and tell everybody. <laughs> She's a fighter, and I knew that if, if she could get her sense about her, she would pull through this with flying colors, which is what she did. Three months after the accident, Heather was released. With rest, rehab, and prayer, she began to heal, thankful for God's miracle. It's surreal, really cool how prayer worked and faith just holding on to his promise, thanking God that I made it. Even in this mess, I've, I've made it. By all accounts, Heather's recovery is nothing short of miraculous. Her lungs were collapsed, liver bleeding, the pain in her legs and her Every rib broken, clavicle broken, you know she couldn't. I mean, she shouldn't be alive. That's a good miracle. Today, Heather is married and works as a nurse. She says God has healed her physically, emotionally, and spiritually. She and her family know as well as anyone what is possible through the power of prayer. And I know he hears me, and he's answered multiple, multiple prayers since this event in my life. And so it just makes him more real. I mean, it's just constant seeing God's hand work through every bit of this, and it's, it's God, it's not any of us. Wow, 
I love coming to work. You know, Dr. McCauley said she shouldn't be alive. Yeah. That's a good miracle. That's right, for <laughs> sure. I mean, what an incredible, miraculous story here. And you know, Brian, I was just so struck by, you know, there's so many ways we pray, right, in situations yes. like this, other than just help me, Lord. Yes. But the prayer of her mom, and you know, I thought, man, I can relate with that prayer mm -hmm. so much. And I just want to encourage you, if you're listening, like maybe there's a situation in your life where you're like, I don't even know how to pray. I know what I want though. I, listen to this mom's prayer. Her, it was so simple. It was like, God, this is what I want, but whatever you want. Yeah. Like that's a prayer of surrender. It's not a prayer of giving up. Giving up. No. It's a prayer of surrender because she knows that God is good, that he actually wants to heal her daughter, that he wants yeah. to do good things. But how often are we in a place where this is what I want, but I'll go with what you want, God. You know, we have a great resource here, Can I Be Healed? I would encourage you right now to stop where you are. Maybe it's you that needs mm. to pray that prayer because you want healing. You want something of the activity of God in your life. Let's just join together in that prayer. Yes. God, this is what I want. Tell God what you want. I want healing, I want restoration, but God, Whatever you want, I'm going to go with it in Jesus' name. That's a prayer of surrender name. that brings great healing. Give us a call, 1-855-759-0700. Prayer partners are standing by. That is so powerful because, you know, one of the places where we struggle the most is what to do when, when tragedy strikes. And uh, what a wonderful but a very easy way to jump into that. And we're blending faith with you. So if you've prayed that prayer, one 759 700 prayer partners are standing by. The thing that I love is that after that, she became a nurse as well because yeah. God was not through with her. And I know he's not through with you either. Yeah. There's a greater plan in store for your life. So call us. We'd love to hear your testimony. Well, up next, a sudden brain injury puts a 13-year boy's life in jeopardy. Mm. See how Isaiah beat the odds. Looking forward to it. September 8, 2015. 13-year-old Isaiah Custodio was at football practice when he got a severe headache and began throwing up. After getting a call from the coach, Isaiah's mom, Christina, came to the field. And that's when I saw him kind of stumbling. I just thought, that's kind of strange. He was saying one word at a time. He kept saying home, hurt, and help. Then I realized something else was wrong. To be safe, Christina took him to the hospital. On the way, she called her husband, Ozzy, who met them there. And I just remember saying, Isaiah is just dehydrated. Maybe he just needs a lot of water, and he's going to be OK. While waiting to see the doctor, Isaiah struggled to communicate and keep his eyes open. Something told me to look in his eyes. I didn't really know what I was doing. So I got my cell phone out, and I shined a light into each eye, and I noticed his pupils were not responding. And that's when I started questioning, OK, something is not right here. They alerted one of the nurses, who immediately took Isaiah back for evaluation. They took him for the CT scan. And when he came back, I could just tell that something was not right. And I said, it's something serious, isn't it? And he said, yeah, it is. The scan revealed a cluster of blood vessels in Isaiah's brain had ruptured and that he needed immediate surgery. Pediatric neurosurgeon Dr. Christopher Troop was on duty. He had a lot of blood uh, in his brain. It was causing a lot of pressure and kind of matched how bad he looked on his exam. Dr. Troop prepared the family for the worst. There was a chance he could bleed to death on the table. At this point, we were just trying to save his life and that, um, he could still have a very bad outcome from this, even if he survived. Now I am talking to God and saying, what in the world is going on? I said, why, why not me? Just take me. 
in place of, of him. As the team started to wheel Isaiah into surgery, Christina stopped them. I said, do you pray? And um, Dr. Troop said, absolutely. And Dr. Troop prayed over him. And I think that moment when he said amen, we felt he was going to be OK. I, I started feeling peace during that time. It was, a, it was just incredible just to see people that we didn't know, uh, these doctors and nurses just gather around, everybody holding hands and just praying around my son. While they waited, Christina sent out a call for prayer. Many came to the hospital. When they don't just pray, when they show up to pray with you, it's just powerful. The surgical team successfully removed the clot and stopped the bleeding. But Dr. Troop cautioned that Isaiah may be unable to speak or even recognize his family when he woke up. It was the best feeling to see him open his eyes and um, acknowledge us. I mean, he's alive and he knew who we were and it was joy. When Dr. Troop came to the doorway, I immediately got up and gave him a big grand hug. I was starting to feel that God was was doing what, you know, he said all along that he would do, and that is take care of us. Recovery would be slow for Isaiah. The injury had affected his ability to speak, and he lost partial use of the right side of his body, making it a struggle to walk. The simplest way they explained it to me was it was like having a baby, and then the baby having to take those baby steps again. Through therapy, hard work, and prayer, he continued to improve. As his speech recovery progressed, he was even able to do what he had missed most, playing his trumpet. It took a while, but I learned to play with my left hand. What keeps me going, my mom, my dad, my grandfather, my grandmother, they keep me on pace. Back in school, Isaiah was soon walking on his own and was even able to act and sing. He's come a long way and has big plans for the future. I want to be a physical therapist because I know what happened to me and I want to give back. His spirit has always been there, his drive. There was never quit in him. His personality just lights up the room. There's not one moment that goes by that I don't thank God. When somebody's asking me, you know, how's your son doing, that I don't mention God's name. He's a miracle, it's just God. People are still praying for him, and I know that God continues to work in him. I know that God saved me because he works with me every single day. It's just God. Don't you love that when his parents in this really difficult situation, they just proclaimed it's all about God, that God can and will do what he, what he will do. And the doctors prayed, everyone prayed for this miraculous recovery of Isaiah. But you know what I see in the story? Isaiah didn't actually recover overnight. In fact, he went on a journey of recovery. And I'm convinced more and more that God loves to take us on a journey of healing. You know, God can and will heal us in an instant, but he also wants us to cooperate with him in a journey of healing and recovery. Look at this young man, Isaiah, who he had some challenges he had to overcome. He worked with therapists he, and became a physiotherapist. I mean, God used his recovery story to now he's helping heal other people, helping people with recovery. Dr. Mary reminds us on this program over and over again that we need to lean into the resources that are available to us. Like maybe you're on a journey of recovery right now. I just wanna speak joy and strength into you. You, that that you can do this. In fact, I've got a resource for you. It's simply called Joy and Strength. Do you want to see something super cool? When you call us for this resource, look what happens. You open it up and it just keeps opening up and look at that. All these verses on joy and strength right from the Word of God that you can claim for yourself in this journey of recovery. You know what? God says, I want to heal you. I want to go with you on the journey of recovery. Will you go with me? I want to pray for you today if you just need some encouragement to continue on a, a journey of recovery. Well, Lord, I lift up uh, 
a, a, a gentleman, I believe, right now who's discouraged. And I just speak joy and strength into his life that he would continue trusting you in this journey of recovering. For anyone else listening, Lord, that they would just lean into you in this time, that they would trust you and stick with this journey of recovery, knowing you are with them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we'll be right back. I looked at the nurse and I mouthed, heart attack, and she nodded and I went, whoa. She's having a heart attack and I don't know if she's gonna live. A lot of fear goes through you. My faith vanished. My faith was a little rattled. I knew I was going. Set your love upon the Lord, you shall not fear. In Christ, I am free from the fear. Have you ever had to let go of something? I mean, like a relationship, a dream, a home, or maybe a job. That can be a big deal. You know, I'm learning more and more what it looks like to trust God these days. Here I spend time with my grandbabies. You know, when you see that they're putting something in their mouth or reaching for something that could hurt them, you simply offer them something else in exchange for what could have been dangerous. So they let go of the old thing and they embrace the new thing. Well. Most of the time, sometimes you have to squeeze it out of their tight little fist, but that's kind of like us too. It's hard to let go of something that we think we really want or need, but trusting God, it requires a leaving or letting go. See, when Jesus called his disciples to follow him, notice that they all had the same response. When he called Peter, James, and John in Luke 5, verses 10 and 11, he said, don't be afraid, love that, from now on you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything and followed him. When Jesus called Matthew in verse 27, he said, follow me and Matthew got up, left everything and followed him. Did you catch that phrase? They left everything and followed him. There is a leaving behind when Jesus calls us to follow him. Now that may sound risky and scary. Maybe that's why Jesus also said, don't be afraid. I like what Susie Eller says, Trusting God leads us to leaving, but when we leave behind, it enables us to pick up something new. Jesus said, I've come that you can have life and have it to the full in John 10.10. 10. So let's reframe what it looks like to trust God by considering what we leave behind and what we pick up in exchange. We leave behind the opinions of others to pick up God's opinion of us. Where others may have said, you can't, you're not good enough, just play it safe, he says, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you in Philippians 4.10. We leave behind our fear and we pick up a new identity as a son or a daughter of the Most High God. Romans 8.15 says, the spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought you into adoption to sonship and daughtership. We leave behind our sin, our brokenness, our bondage, and we pick up his righteousness, his wholeness, his freedom. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any was, anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. We leave behind our depression and we pick up his garment of praise for our heaviness, according to the Psalms. We leave behind our limited dreams we pick up his God-sized dreams. We leave behind our inability, we pick up his, his ability. We leave behind our meaningless efforts and we step into his already prepared plans and purposes for us. Ephesians 2.10 says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Are you catching it? To trust God means to leave behind what you don't want to hold on to anyway, in order to pick up so much more. He has already prepared good works for you to do before you were even born. So trusting God means that you actually get to live your best life. Trusting God isn't about a destination, but it's rather about a journey, a journey with Jesus, a journey you don't have to do alone or in your own strength, but rather you put your hand in his hand and when he says, follow me, you drop everything, just like his disciples did. It doesn't mean it's a perfect road ahead with no trouble. 
No, in fact, Jesus guarantees that there's risks, even danger involved in this adventure of trust, but he promises to never leave us and he gives us everything we need along the way. What is God asking you to leave behind in order to pick up so much more? His invitation is the same for you and me as it was for his disciples. Jesus said, come, follow me. I have so much more for you. That's courageous living. Now there are more ways to connect with the 700 Club Canada online. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash 700 Club Canada. Find us on Instagram at 700 Club Canada or follow us on Twitter at 700 Club Canada. Just email cba at 700club.ca or visit us at 700club.ca. Welcome back. Thank you for being a part of this incredible journey with 700 Club Canada. And if you haven't been, we'd like to encourage you to become a monthly partner. For just $20 a month, you can become a 700 Club Canada partner. And as our thank you, we'd love to get into your hands this new DVD, The I Wheels of God. You know, it goes through Psalms 91, and Pat Robertson teaches us how we can break anxiety and fear. Because the Bible literally says, He that dwell in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Mighty, I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress. In him I will trust. You know, it's such a, an encouragement if you call now. The number is 1-855-759-0700, and we'll get that to you right away. Yeah, what a great program today, Overcoming yes. the Odds. Yes. Right? And it doesn't matter how long you've lived, you're going to overcome at some point. There's always going to be something to overcome. That's right. And yeah. God goes with us through the overcoming. That's right. You know, it's this is a... This is a marathon, not a sprint. Absolutely. Right? Yes. <laughs> and God is with you in this in this marathon, this side of heaven. Mm -hmm. And and he goes with you in the overcoming and he will give you everything you need for the overcoming. Because he is yes. the overcomer. And we want to thank you for all your praise reports, but also your prayer requests. Would you put on your prayer list June? And we're gonna be praying for June, but I believe that you're going to be included in this as well. She's asking for Heathcliff who needs a passport and a visa. And June's also praying for Benny, who is looking for a house. All right, let's touch and agree. Father, we touch and agree with Heathcliff, and we ask you also for all of those that are needing a door open that's against the odds. In Jesus' name, we, pre we pray, Romans 8, 28, all things are working together for the good of them that love you. In mm -hmm. Jesus' name. Yeah, and we pray for Benny. We agree with June's prayers that he would find that open door, literally that house that he can live in. Would you provide that, God, in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. We receive it on your behalf. And why don't you take this power verse with you as we leave? Psalm 72, 14 to 15 says, You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you've redeemed your people. Amen. Until next time, keep believing. Take care. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada. The village is called Magdala, the home of Mary Magdalene. She lived here and she met Jesus here and she continued with him. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's the place.